Recording in progress. Hello and welcome. Audio test. Is my audio coming through okay for everyone? You can let me know in the chat. And let's turn on video. Video seems to be working fine as well. Okay, there we go. Is the audio video okay? Thank you for showing up early while we do some audio video tests. I'm sort of getting the hang of this. Okay. So that will be on mute. And what can people see? They can see the webcam and then the webcam and screen. Okay. There are two panelists here, so I need to leave the meeting in order to make sure that you don't see two of me. There we go. Okay, looks solid. Can you let me know in the chat if you can hear me? Is the audio quality okay? Welcome to, awesome, thank you so much. All right, welcome to the final day. This isn't going to be like a wind down session. It's going to be a chill session, um, but there's still a lot of information here, um, a lot of stuff to enhance your practice. Uh, we're going to be going into the tongue after a short level of review. And uh, just so you know, like I have not been like the, the, the trainings that you're seeing in front of you are not pre-planned entirely. So what you're seeing today is a reflection of like the emails that I got, the questions in the Q&A box. Um, so this is tailored to this group of people. So this is a training based on what everyone here wanted to see. Um, what I've been requesting is practice though. So let me throw up a poll right now just to see who's been practicing yep. and where you are at in your level of feeling. So what we'll do today, please do answer the polls. Um, what we'll do today is go through a brief review and then get into deeper topics like the tongue, which is why mewing works, mewing and chewing, why it works for a lot of people. Um, there's a deeper concept in there. That's really important. Good. Somebody, uh, well, actually multiple people have asked about the recordings. From yesterday, it seems like about half of the people got them. So when this all wraps up, I'm going to send everybody the recordings as one package. You'll get one page that has all the recordings on it. Yeah. So most people are practicing, which is excellent. Um, as has been said again and again, your results with this are largely going to depend on your level of practice. Nothing other than your level of practice. So everyone can get this and will get this with practice. Um, and 70% of you can feel the breathing into the neck and the head. And about 10% right now are getting the feeling of the flexing of the skull bones on the inhale. That might be because the participation rate's lower than it was uh, in the previous uh, trainings. Okay. So we, we've had some fluctuation there. But as long as you keep practicing, you're going to get flexing and you're going to get opening there. Okay. So. We'll start off into the meditation. You have to be calm in order to feel the sensory information through your body. Again, it's not an exercise. I'm not telling you to do anything that you're not already doing. What you're going to do right now is pay attention to your chest. that every time you inhale, your chest widens and expands. That's 100% of the population. Everyone has their chest widening and expanding on the inhale. If you're more of a belly breather, you're trying to do diaphragmatic, something in here, this general region is expanding on the inhale. Because of the fascia that runs through the whole body, what we're gonna do is try and notice how the whole network plays a role in the breath. 
So if you take your palms and put them face up on your knees, so your hands are on your knees and your palms are facing up, what you'll notice is that your breath goes more into your upper chest. And then when you turn your hands around, palms down, you notice that your breath goes into your belly. Experiment with that a few times. And like always, as I go through the theory, continue breathing. Continue noticing the breathing. This is the crux of what we're doing here. See, this, this might be an exercise. It seems like an exercise. But this is just how your body works. So we're just noticing how the body works. Okay. Now, if you clench your hands into a fist with a little bit of anger, if you want to muster it, take breaths like that and see how much you're able to inhale. Now, on the next breath, relax your hands and see how much deeper that inhale is. If you can feel it through the body, what you should start doing is things like clenching your feet and clenching your pelvic floor, areas like that, to get the feeling into the head. The feeling of expansion going into the head, not blood pressure, but rather the cranial fluid and also the expansion of the fascia and the bones, that whole network. That's as an exercise. Once you can feel it, you can periodically clench your hands, clench your feet, do that sort of thing to get the breathing up there again. But once you can feel it up there, you, you don't have to do that. You're just sitting here, I'm giving this training. As soon as I pay attention to my breath, I can feel as clear as day what it's doing. And that's the level we all want to get to, okay? For correction. So as a quick review, the reason that this works is because all of these structures down the neck and down your body are involved in breathing. Um, evolutionarily speaking, embryologically speaking, that the arcs that become, say, your gills in a fish, which is a breathing mechanism, those become your jaw and throat. And the nervous system connections there are all maintained. Okay, so this is like what becomes Meckel's cartilage. Um, what becomes Meckel's cartilage becomes a, a gill, one of the first gills of breathing in a fish. In you, that turns into the structure of your jawbone. The jawbone retains that breathing function. And so does all of the musculature and all, the, all of the fascial network and nervous system down the sides of your neck, into your ribs, and through the whole body. Why this is important is because this breathing mechanism is what drives the development of the skull. It tugs down on the lower third and it pulls it down into proper shape and proportion. It, it opens up the skull because you have sutures and synchondrosis and stuff as you're growing. These need to be kept open to grow properly. If they jam up together, you get craniosynostosis. In a baby, it's really evident because their head really goes misshapen. But if you get that sort of jamming up in, say, your seven, eight, nine, into your teenage years, and then you essentially have the same issue, but it, it shows up as a minor asymmetry compared to like how obvious it would have been if that happened right when you were a baby. On top of that, peer-reviewed science, the studies show that alternating forces are what drive growth at the sutures. So everything in this universe and in your body happens in rhythms. It, it flows in rhythms and growth happens in rhythm. Studies show that rhythmic movement causes growth at the sutures. So you don't just need pressure and pull on your skull and those bones to cause growth. You need a rhythmic pressure and pull which is provided by the breathing because you are constantly 
inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. You're constantly doing a slight tug. And this is evident in the master process in the temporal bone. Um, the temporal bone doesn't exist when you're a baby. It, it forms over time. You can see left to right here. As your SCMs and these muscles steadily pull the back of your head. And the majority of your facial growth and your skull growth happens at this bottom third where those muscles attach into. Okay. And that is why an undergrown face looks neotenous. It, it looks un, like a more childlike because it literally is. It's not that you grew downward in our feeling, in our thought theory. It's not that you grew downward or that your face melted or something like that. You just didn't grow fully enough. You have to expand in all directions. The, the body and the face and the skull, I think it's a tensegrity structure. It all expands at once. You don't just move the maxilla and move this bone, move that bone. Everything fits together like a puzzle and it has to expand and open at once. And the breath is what does that. This was noticed by like the founders of uh, cranial osteopathy and um, cranial sacrotherapy that the bone, specifically the temporal bone, seems to be set up in such a way that it allows for this sort of movement. It encourages this sort of movement. It's beveled like the gills of a fish. It's, it's funny that you know our, our thought patterns overlap in that sort of way. Um, what, I, what I'd love to share with you about this is a lot of this was stuff that I practiced on myself. And then I looked it up and saw that other people agreed where I practiced on myself, taught it to others. And there's an image in here that I didn't even know existed until like two days ago, um, where it's, it really is exciting to come to a conclusion yourself and then find out that other people have come to that sort of conclusion because it, it really validates it. Um, so the temporal bone is really at the crux of what we're trying to do in this class, okay? For the purposes of this class, um, it makes the most sense to start with there. Um, the reason is the temporal bone is where this, this mastoid process that grows and gets tugged on, this whole area at the back of the skull is where the STM attaches into. And of course, we're going to get into the tongue and all this as well. And we'll have a look real quick at the fact that the, the temporal bone massively overlaps the parietal bone. And it's, it's set up in such a way to encourage like a breathing motion. Every single time you breathe in and out. Now, this has been detected by cranial psychotherapists, but as far as I understand, they have been unable to replicate. If you get like, say, 10 cranial psychotherapists in a room and they try to feel the rhythm of the skull bones, they tend to feel different rhythms. They, they haven't had like a agreed upon this person is having a rhythm of this many alternations per minute. Um, I think it's because the main driver is actually just the main is the respiration. Of course, all the rhythms are interlinked, but um, the way that the, the muscles attach, as you'll see here, this SCM muscle, the way it attaches links up into the cranial bones in such a way, like the temporal bone is beveled up here, and it's basically designed to slide forward. And the occiput is basically designed to rotate back and all that on the inhalation. And that is exactly how the muscles of your neck attach into those bones. They attach such that every time that they tug, they would pull the bones in the way that they seem to be designed to move. Now, the thing that's going on, that's going on on the outside. So that's your skull and the outside of the head, outside of the neck. What is going on on the inside of it is. First off, on the left, you have the cranial sacral fluid or the cerebrospinal fluid. And studies show, peer-reviewed science shows that this is largely driven by the respiration. So every time you breathe in, you have an increase in cranial pressure. Intercranial, like you, the fluid pressure inside of your head increases and it pushes out on your skull bones. Okay, So that's the internal driving force to push everything out. And internally, you also have a resistance to that. This is the dura mater, the meninges, okay? And this is like a tight fascia. We're using the word fascia loosely to describe almost everything, but like it's a tight connective tissue in your head. And it basically holds the thing together. And this is where, this is the stage that um, a lot of dentistry 
and those fields have gotten to is the understanding because now when they do MSc, they get an osteopath on board. Um, and the osteopath will typically look at the head and the meninges and try to like relax it and adjust the cranial bones such that the MSc expansion, the maxillary skeletal expansion doesn't happen unevenly. Because if one of the tentoriums or the bones in this place are jammed up, you're gonna get uneven expansion. And for the most part, what happens is you, you barely get expansion. Even if you expand a centimeter, you barely get expansion up in your nose and the skull because your meninges, which are the toughest, the toughest before bone, okay? Like basically any tighter than the meninges and tendons and you're into bone territory. It's not really designed to move, it'll flex, but it's not designed to like expand unless it releases. Um, and that's the reason why most of the techniques we use so far, they don't actually get that 3D expansion that we want. Um, it's because it's in the meninges. Those have to let go so that the rest of the skull can develop. This meninges, we're in review territory still. So like, I hope you're catching up and um, we're almost at the level of the tongue and we're gonna get into some really interesting stuff. Okay. So this meninges is one of the diaphragms of the body. We're not the first people to look at all of these diaphragms, which again, I like, because if we were just pulling up a bunch of stuff that no one had ever discussed before, it wouldn't be as confidently spoken about, but like people have already noticed these things. We're just tying them together in a way that makes sense and that you can practice on yourself. So whereas they're getting a cranial osteopath, I don't know if we might have an osteopath. We, I know we do have cranial sacral therapists in the meetings, um, in these trainings, and those people get it right away. And I would love for the fact that now you can just practice on yourself and patients can practice on themselves. We're getting to the point where people can feel their own tentorium and they can manipulate it with the breath and the neck muscles in such a way that they get pops and cracks and adjustments at the sutures and in the nasal maxillary area. So you have multiple diaphragms all through your body. This entire class has been focused on the head diaphragm. Okay, because that, that is it's quite important. And the extended training um, really goes into this is whole body breathing, right? So we're going to go into the whole body. Your main chain of respiration is this Z chain. Okay, so you got the psoas, which connects up into the back of the diaphragm. The diaphragm goes to the front of the body, and then your chest, your neck, these SCM muscles go to the back of the head, which then connects into that head diaphragm. Uh, that's that's the main chain of respiration, according to not only us but uh, other sources as well. And this is like really well established. We have a we have a method in within the training called the SOAS sit up, um, which really it's something I invented. I'm quite proud of. Um, it's like a it's a hundred percent way to get people feeling the fact that every single time you breathe in, your SOAS is evolved. So like, what is your SOAS? It's this muscle that runs from your inner thigh through your hip up to your middle back. And this is uh, called the tender, this is the part of the, the beef, the steak, that's like the tenderloin or the filet mignon. Um, and this is also in like say trauma release exercise because as you know, trauma is a big reason for the frontal chain collapse. Um, it, it's been speculated for a long time and scientifically more and more research for a long time that trauma and memory stored in the body, the psoas is a really deep muscle and seems to be really, really um, core to deep trauma, deep memories and the release of them. Um, there's, there's a whole chain of uh, practice called trauma release exercise, which uh, the US State Department is using on like soldiers with PTSD and stuff. Um, and essentially what they do is they hammer the, the psoas with a lot of activity a lot of exercise until it gets really tired and then they relax it and then the person's legs and so as they're shaking and then the memories start coming up and they release and they relax um and these are people that like you know they might have some sort of shell shock type behavior or like uh those you know ptsd type behaviors and that starts to dissipate um so the way we look at it well the way we've identified it is essentially you have the psoas the diaphragm chain that's well recognized I think that this chest 
neck head diaphragm chain this as above so below i haven't really seen anyone else exploring it the way we do and the reason we're exploring it so deeply is because we want cranial facial correction that's where i came to this from let me give you a little bit of story actually how whole body breathing came about um i went to the dentist and they said you know you have underbite you need double jaw surgery and that was it's quite an invasive surgery um i started feeling like i you're telling me there's something inherently wrong with my body and that just didn't sit right with me so i started looking into alternatives to that uh, dr mike mew came up um and so i became quite interested and found a community of people who were quite interested in getting proper growth of the skull i found out that wisdom teeth not coming in crooked teeth uh sleep apnea tmg these are modern issues you know you look in the archaeological record about ten thousand years ago is when these issues start right about when agriculture um depending on how you view the history um skulls prior to that did not have these issues and it's clear as day that animals don't have these issues so much either and there's been a lot of speculation about why it is that humans have degenerated in this way to a huge degree it's not even like a marginal amount of people have these issues almost everyone has them um and this is our my speculation which we're going to get into that your whole body is meant to breathe you have frontal chains and back chains that are the tensegrity structure that pulls you into breathe, like open into breathing properly. This breathing motion, it drives almost all of your systems, including this cranial sacral system, which is grows the skull and such. And it's essentially uh, a humanity as a whole and an organism that's been traumatized to a level that's not functioning properly. It's its tensegrity system has collapsed and that becomes epigenetic. We'll get into that in a moment. So where your where your neck muscles connect into the SCMs and these big ones, they connect into what is this head diaphragm. I did see a post someone was asking, hey, how are the zygomatic bones in the, in the head diaphragm? Uh, you just have a look, visually speaking. Um, they they connect out to the outside. They're like an outside representation of that. Okay. Um, and importantly, so where those neck muscles connect on the outside where all these sutures meet and it pulls your skull open on the outside, on the exact inside of that is your tentorium. And also your Fox Rebri. Uh, the connection point of these is Sutherland's fulcrum, and which is hypothesized to be like a real storage point of tension in the body of this tension membrane. And as people do the breathing, one of the things that they notice is a feeling in the third eye area. Okay, so there's like uh, something called the primal midline, and there's things that we're, this is the topic we're going to be getting into in the second half of this webinar. Um, you know, ancient practices around the world, whole body breathing pulls in from all of them, and they all seem to fit within our paradigm really well, like really, really well. Um, so this, this tension membrane that runs through your body seems to really focus on the meninges in the head. And when people can start feeling that with the breathing, they feel a tug at their third eye right up here. And where that is, is where the Fox Rebri connects into your ethmoid process. And you start noticing that up here. Okay. If you want your skull to expand, if you want maxilla expansion, um, you essentially need to loosen the meninges. And the way that you do that, Hopkins Institute has found that your fascia through the whole body is just as sensitive as your skin or almost as sensitive as your skin. When you have a headache, you can feel it. When you have a sharp pain somewhere inside your body, you can feel it. But all the other times you're unconscious of it. Just like you're almost always unconscious of your breath. The whole fascial network is involved in the breath. So if you tune into your breathing and pay attention to your breathing, and slowly you build up your level of awareness with practice, then all of this unconscious stuff that usually you only feel when it hurts or it starts to degenerate, you can consciously feel it. And once you can consciously feel it, you actually understand how your structure is wound up, how it's tied up, and you can start getting adjustments and popping things back open. Okay. That is our aim. You become your own practitioner. So the way that we do that, we're about to get to a meditation. So if you are not calm and relaxed by now, 
I, I suggest you chill, chill out. Okay. I'll give my I'll give myself that advice too. I get a bit excited doing presentations and we're we're gonna get into woo territory. So there is a <laughs> an unexplainable component to doing this as a group. So I really appreciate when you came live. I know a lot of you couldn't make it. You're going to get the replays. Um, but when you come live and when we do this as a group, there's a component of the breathing time and time again. I haven't told people to expect this. I didn't know that it would happen, but they say we get it better when we do it with you, when we do it with the group. Um, and I believe that. Um, that's how meditativeness tends to work. So what is essentially happening is your neck muscles, which logically speaking, you understand how they work. If your SEM tugs, it pulls your head back, right? And so every time you breathe in, your chest is getting lifted a bit by the SEM, which correspondingly tugs back on your head, tugs back on the temporal bone in exactly the same way the temporal bone is set up to rotate. And same goes with all of these other muscles. So if you are new, if this is your, the first time on the training, when we go into the breathing practice that we're about to, try to feel the breathing through your body as we've practiced. Reminder, you're listening to me. Put your palms up and down. Clench your fists. It takes time to get good at this. Okay? And feel the breathing through your body. Now, what the new thing we're going to introduce today in terms of what musculature is the tongue. So yesterday we did feeling of the SCMs, sternocleidomastoid, and we did the feeling of the muscles that attach underneath the jaw, the suprahyoid muscles, infrahyoid. So let's connect this chain here and this chain here. The tongue has been, and as studies show, that... So people do get results, right? With things like uh, myofunctional therapy, orthotropics, mewing, chewing. Um, the results that they get, I theorize, taking this paper as inference. So this research paper, I infer from this, it shows that the jaw and the neck and the tongue muscles, like your, your chewing muscles, those activate the neck muscles, the SEM specifically, okay? So when you start doing those sort of myofunctional things, you're working in here, but you end up activating all of this neck musculature. Not that this musculature is not important. We're gonna see in a bit, next slide, how the tongue's involved. But it's like, okay, why do some people tend to get results with those methods, it's really good results? Um, because I think they're activating a deeper deeper set of fascia than the front. They're, they're activating something that's very deep in the muscle chain, which is your SCMs and this process. Okay, if you have questions, somebody's already done a really good thing, drop them in the Q&A so I can see them after, okay? So the back third of the tongue is uh, of course like a really important topic. And when people get it up, a lot of them seem to get results. Where is the back third of the tongue? If you've been you know, keeping up with the people that are really uh, at the public forefront, the Mews, um, even John Mew and Mike Mew have had some debate with each other. Like, where's the back third? They don't necessarily agree with each other. Um, I'm more on the John Mew side of it, where the back third of the tongue is the part that goes down your throat. Where does your tongue start? I should have put a poll before I asked. Where, where does your tongue start? This is your hyoid down here. So put your, find the hyoid bone. I got a beard covering it. But you should be able to find it, okay? Even if you can't find the bone exactly, just find the cartilage down here. You got hard cartilage, okay? And now play with your tongue. Move it around. Your tongue starts down here. This is the back third, okay? So get a feel for that back third. What's gonna be important in a couple of slides is understanding that the individual muscle doesn't matter, okay? It, it's just for anatomy textbooks and for explaining anatomy in general, I have to, we have to give these muscles a name. This is the tongue, but really it's just the fascial web. 
um, when they cut open a cadaver, you know, they do dissections or surgeons know this, um, medical professionals know this, you can take somebody and say they need to have a surgery on their, uh, their neck. You open them up and hey, this person has a sternocleidomastoid that has an extra attachment point. Or hey, this person's sternocleidomastoid attaches here or here. We're not built out of like a purely, yeah, we're not built out of like a purely, you know, uh, regimented system. You just, you have a fascial web and the muscles in that web attach where they need to according to the function. And it's plastic. The same way your brain is plastic, your entire fascial network is plastic in that way. It'll readjust. It'll, it'll reconfigure itself. And that's what we're trying to do. We're kind of reconfiguring and restructuring the entire network, which includes the bones floating in it. As we get deeper and deeper into this, we won't even look at the bones as different in the network, okay? It's all just one big structure. So get a feel for your back third of your tongue. The back third of your tongue muscles connect up into our favorite bone for this class, the temporal, I can't stop. Temporal bone, okay, up into the styloid process. So when you pull back, so like when you have a look at the SCM, oh, you can only see my face, you can't see the screen, there you go. So when you pull back on the SCM, you tug and it tugs the back of your head. This was the, the study I was talking about, by the way, in case that was not on screen regarding the jaw and the tongue and the neck muscles. So when you pull back, this is the back third of your tongue. It goes down into your throat. And all of these muscles attach up into that temporal bone. And even more, there's, there's the deep neck muscles, the deep throat muscles, palatine, levin, so they, they attach into the sphenoid and the cranial base. Okay. When you pull back in this direction, can you see my mouse? When you pull back on the back third of your tongue, what reciprocally you're pulling down on your temporal bone in exactly the same way that a craniosacral therapist would theorize that it should move or an osteopath would theorize that it's designed to move this way. I want people to try that. It doesn't necessarily have to be linked to the inhale because you have control of these muscles. Find the back third of your tongue and pull it towards the back of your throat or pull it up and back. I don't have a poll here. I'm not sure if I can make up a poll in the middle of a meeting, but I want to know how people are feeling this. Yeah, yeah I can create a poll. Uh -oh. If I jump all the way to webinar information. Good. Let's create a poll right here on the fly. Keep doing this, keep practicing, and you will see how wonky Zoom's interface is. Um, yes. When I say, can you feel the tongue? Pull the skull bones. Good. And what a lot of you, I won't tell you what to feel. Okay. Um, you can drop in the chat. So if someone's asking up and back or up and forward, up and back. Pull it up and towards the back. So. And if you can feel it, drop in. I'm not gonna tell you what to feel, but drop in the chat if you can feel anything special, okay? So you're, you're, this back third of your tongue, which drops into your throat, pull it towards your ears. You just pull the up, middle up and back. And you can have a look on the screen here just to visualize that the way that the muscles, yeah, if, if you have TMJ issues, don't pull too hard, okay? You're not pulling the front of the tongue, only this area. So almost like a swallow, a proper swallow pushes your, pulls your tongue up and back. The reason you're feeling that in your TMJs is the fact that, yeah, they link right up into this is where your TMJ is. So you're getting a pull right there. Okay. And so you're tugging these cranial bones. 
I almost want to let the cat out of the bag, but I, uh, this is this is part of my method is I can only tell you what to do. And then certain people have repeatable results, which I can't say right here because then you can imagine them. And I don't want you to imagine things. It has to be actually what's happening. Okay. What we're proposing is that on every inhale, all of these muscles contract, including the tongue. So this is a proper swallow. This is proper chewing. Every time, single time the tongue is doing that, you're getting this tug on the temporal bone, which is the same tug that happens with the breathing. Okay, you can see all this connection. It connects up into the mastoid process. Th this is why mewing, chewing, all those things. Um, can I recommend a cue? Um, okay, so someone has said, thank you very much. Um, from an oxygen advantage instructor, they learned that if you feel the air going in through your nose directly backwards and downwards to the back of your throat, you'll feel the pull. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. So if you can feel the air coming in through your nose and track it through your airway into your throat, then you'll get a feel essentially for the back of the airway. Because what is this right here between this is the top of your airway, if you see my mouse. And this is really important for how we open up the airway or we theorize we're going to open up the airway for sleep apnea. Okay. So this is the top of your airway, and you're essentially just feeling that. And you're feeling what's happening in here. And you should feel a tug on this bone. And for some of you, that tug might translate into other areas of the skull, okay, depending on your level of feeling. Let me ask a question. Let me ask that poll. Um, you can feel that. I'll show you, uh, keep it on the screen so you can see honestly where we're at. We're at 51% participation. I, I request high participation because, you know, if, if we're at 25% of people not getting it, right? So if you're one of those 25% that don't get it, then that means that we have to develop cues for you because we're, we're trying to understand how the body works and we, this makes logical sense. And so if it's not in your experience, we have to develop the proper cues so that you can understand it. Okay, That's my responsibility to be able to, uh, make you feel it good so about 75 percent of people got it about 25 percent do not okay the the 25 percent do not if you can feel the scms i would keep your focus there um and if you can't feel anything we're i'm actually going to give you uh something within this training that will help you get a feel for your body because what an issue i've noticed is that some people they they can't feel inside their body so much it's, it's very numb so as you get more and more sensitive then you can pick up on these things a lot and a lot more Okay, so there's your breathing practice right there. I think that's pretty fair. We spent a lot of time on it. And what you're seeing here is essentially, like this is the same direction as the sternocleidomastoid. Like you see these muscles attach up here. They're, these are essentially right under the SEM muscle, okay? So the way we look at this is that these are all one big chain. They all work together to open up the head diaphragm and the diaphragms down the body. The whole body is called whole body breathing. The entire body, every single bit of the musculature gets triggered to inhale. It's all involved. Okay. And you can feel its involvement and you can feel where it's stuck. Now, on the right hand side, and this is, this is that image I was excited about because I didn't know this existed. I didn't know they agreed with us because I don't have their book. Um, but this is anatomy train saying that the back line of the spine, and this is what we're talking about right now is the front line in terms of anatomy trains. What happens is they, they'll, they'll cut open a cadaver and they'll see that these aren't just muscle compartments. You know, when you, when you take apart a body, um, this, these muscles are not independent of each other. They form chains, lines of fascia through the whole body that transfer force, okay? efficiently transfer force. 
fascia is very efficient. That's why your, your posture is not based on your mus musculature. If you had to, when you try to hold your posture with your muscles, what happens? Sit up straight. Your muscles get tired, you collapse. Your posture is driven by your fascial chains and the bones. And bringing those into alignment is what we do. Okay? And really all the muscles are is just tugging on the fascia. Okay? So the way that uh, anatomy trains and them look at it um, is that essentially your back line pulls your back into extension. And in yoga, if, you, if any of you have taken yoga, hatha yoga, classical yoga, again, we, we pull in from all disciplines. And when they team, seem to keep agreeing with us, which is amazing. And when they don't, I, I do make it clear that they don't. Okay? Um, that on the inhale in yoga, you extend your back. On the exhale is when you, you flex forward. Okay? So this back line pulls your back open or it pulls your back into extension. And the front line pulls the front of your body open. And the way they liken that is to like a sailboat. You see this one line that's taut, very tight, tautness. That's your back line. And that tightens a little bit and it just pulls the front of the body open. One diaphragm, head diaphragm. Two diaphragms is your main breathing diaphragm. You got your pelvic diaphragm here and you got your foot diaphragm down here. This is the bubbling spring. They say the wise man breathes from his heels. Right. So you have the wise man breathes even from his heels. Okay. So you have these diaphragms out the front, this tug down the back like a sailboat, it pulls open the front of your body. And if these postural lines collapse, we'll get into why they do that in a moment. Your your diaphragms don't open, you you don't fully form, you don't have a proper structure. Okay. And um the, this is kind of like a a deep peek into so the deep understanding is we told you to breathe with your SCM, try it, what happens, and then pull your tongue into it, what happens, and then take a step back and see it's just, it's all one fascial net. It's just one big web of fascia to the point where eventually you stop, you use the muscles for now. For now, locate your SCM and try to feel it in the temporal bone. For now, use the back of your tongue and try to feel it. If you have TMJ issues, and those sort of things that you're trying to avoid flaring up in any way, first off, don't pull tight. I'm not telling you to tug, although I have to watch my wording. I'm not telling you to tug. I'm not telling you to pull. I'm telling you just to notice what happens on every breath anyways. So you're not breathing any deeper than you usually breathe, unless you get really good at it, and then it's up to you how much force you want to use on your own body, okay? You're your own physician here. But what we're trying to do is an awareness that the whole body is involved in the breathing. This happens anyways, regardless of whether you try to do it. And then when you become aware of it doing this, you become aware of asymmetrical pulls and you become aware of front lines and back lines being overpowered. And, you know, some parts that should be breathing are not breathing. They're locked down due to trauma. Good. That's our Z pattern. Now, Here is the important bit. And I think at this point, like if you have a question, slot it into the Q&A, okay? That's the crux of our theory, that you have these lines of fascia, a back line, a front line, and this respiration chain. And they need to be functioning properly in order for your body to expand into its, the, the way the tensegrity structure functions, it needs to expand open. And it all expands and collapses at once. You don't just move your maxilla back and forth around and around. Like the whole thing needs to expand at once. This is why when you get braces or you get these sort of uh, even surgeries, um, you get retainers or else they relapse. The reason that they relapse is because you can't just change this. The whole fascial chain will just pull it back to where it thinks it should be. Okay, Your, your body's maintaining this equilibrium within itself. And so if anything gets shifted, it'll just pull it back. That's why surgeries relapse. Um, that's why a lot of methods relapse, because you have to deal with the source of the issue, which is the fact that these fascial chains are responsible for the structure of the body, and um, their collapse is the collapse of the structure of the body. Let's go a step deeper. Okay. 
I'm going to ask a poll. I want to know if people want to go deeper. Are we ready to go? This is woo. Okay. So we try to stay within, and not by try, we do. We do stay within peer reviewed science as much as possible and also extensive experience. So, like, you know, if thousands of physiotherapists notice the same type of patterns in the body and we consider that medical a compilation of evidence okay and that combined with uh people's experience now why is there this modern collapse in humans to explain that we're going to go a little bit into woo so like i want to ask are we ready for that like do i have permission to go into woo land and just to share with you what my thoughts are on this topic yeah I want uh, as much participation as we can get here. Because this is where things can get exciting as well. Like, I mean, I th I'm pretty excited about the other stuff too, but like this is quite um, where everything ties together. You know, when you look at old, older, more ancient practices, they all sort of hint at the sort of things we're exploring as well. And so, okay, nobody said no. I'll show you that. Nobody said no. 25% um, of you. Wu land is like, you know, uh, a little bit, Woo woo, we're we're talking more inference stuff, okay? Um, and a lot of you say that you're already here. It's a trick question. You're are everyone's already here. You can't go anywhere else. There's no escaping Wu Land. That's the reality you live in is Wu Land, um, by itself. Okay, this is it's an inexplicable reality. You have to make inferences. You have to, uh, go into that sort of realm to understand things. Um, that's why they have like a not the Raja in front of certain. Um, okay, so. A really good question that was asked is why is this a modern human problem? So, are, am I implying that pre agri like say let's not say pre agriculture like pre industrial pre agriculture humans around ten thousand years ago and humans that currently exist in largely pre agri industrial type of societies. So if you go into you know tribal communities, they still have really good structure. They don't have these issues. If you go into villages in a large part of the developing world, um, parts of the world that are developing, and people still have largely very good structure. But when you go into cities, you tend to see a, a massive collapse. And a lot of thought has been put into what causes this. Some people say it's hard foods. Some people say it's uh, breastfeeding. Um, you know, tongue posture, uh, pollutants. So if you have, um, say, allergies, things like that, that cause you to mouth breathe. All of those fit, I propose, that they fit within our explanation here. So, you know, breastfeeding, chewing hard foods, because chewing and all that activates this function over here. Yeah, the SCM in the tongue. Okay. Mewing, um, allergies basically breaks this down. To a large degree you know if you end up mouth breathing you open your mouth and you end up breaking the chain quite a bit is that the entirety of it i don't think so because i see people i just got back from a trip from india well not a trip i was there for like 11 months um i see poor people who are malnourished i see people who live in the more polluted environments uh eating very soft foods and um the, the correlation is not strong enough of, of those other reasons. The correlation to that to actually proper jaw growth just doesn't seem strong enough. There does seem to be a strong parent to child component, which does break down quickly, it seems. Um, within three generations, you can have people that were fully formed, and then the grandkids have like really recessed jaws and really poor structure. So what's going on here? As we've described, you have essentially this front and this back line. And these structures tug on each other and they work reciprocally to pull open the body properly, pull open the diaphragm, so the head, the hips, the pelvis, the feet, they're all important. Two things can happen. To break this line down essentially you can have the back line just become really weak not enough activity not for a multitude of reasons the back line becomes weak it can't open the front line 
And one of the main reasons is that the front line accumulates traumatic experience. Your mind and your body are one thing, okay? So when you feel a heartbreak or you feel scared or you feel nervous or something frightens you, you don't feel it in your head. You feel it in your body. You feel it in your viscera, viscerocranium viscera. You feel it down the front of your body and it contracts. It's a fearful contraction, egoic response called samkocha in the, in the yogic uh, cultures that or shamanic armoring, if you've heard of stuff like that, armoring of the body. Um, and just typically known as, you know, uh, body posture. A confident person has a very open posture. The front of their body is open. A person who is stereotypically downtrodden and being down is hunched over, protective of their viscera, of their front. And that's because traumatic experience builds up there. And people have been finding more and more. I, I, we have to trust, I think, the people that really work with trauma patients, psychology, you know, everyone who works with them, say that there, there is this component where the posture and all this is tied together. Now, in less industrialized societies and prior to 10,000 years ago, what you would have is a lot of activity and exercise which releases trauma. So as someone pointed uh, out, was asking like, hey, if I breathe into this area, I can feel it's tight and contracted, like what do I do? You can psychosomatically release it. That's one capacity that you have. You can breathe into that area, feel the emotions. You might cry. And I think everyone's experienced this. When you cry, all of a sudden you're breathing really well. Like you let something go. And then usually you, you end up back in that thing because you didn't recognize the pattern. As you let go of the patterns, the breathing opens up more and more. Another way of doing this is just working out. This is why athletes are mentally healthier. This is why exercise just makes you mentally. I mean, there's a, a huge amount of chemical reasons as well, but it's just the fact that when you're working out these adhesions, Everything is psychosomatic, so it has a physical and a mental component. If you physically work out a trauma, right, you get broken up with, and you just hit the gym. I know it's not that simple, but like you really um, remember to drop questions in the Q&A. You really end up opening up your, your body over time. Um, those release trauma, and those sort of uh, pre-industrial societies prior to 10,000 years ago, they would have had a lot of that sort of release, okay? What that exercise also does is it builds the proper fascial tension. So as we've shown, this, this back line is meant to be tight. It's meant to have that tension down it. And you're supposed to have tension during, down various lines of your body. They help your body move and provide its structure. If you're not using your body, so say in the example of like, Sri Ramana Maharishi, who has a very collapsed body, because all through his youth, he just sat. So you, you, there's this balance between the tension of the body and the, the relaxedness of the body that forms a proper structure. So you need exercise to kind of work it all out, work out the extra kinks that you shouldn't have in there, shake it off like a Taylor Swift thing. And you need exercise to essentially make the proper lines actually tight okay and the top athletes the top athletes have very properly developed fascial structures like the the arc of their foot or their back lines are very strong okay and that is why people see improvement um when they start working out they also see improvement in that way okay number two is that there's trauma release exercise, which happens in pre-industrial societies and in more ancient societies that were just normal. You know, when you go to talk therapy, if you have an issue, if you have something bugging you and you just talk about it, you just feel it kind of release out of your body. Okay. If, you, if you've been around older generations of people, they talk a lot, they, they just, communicate with each other, this connection, this interpersonal connection is really important. 
Um, and contact is the third thing I listed here that people would kind of sleep huddled up in a ball. There'd be a lot more human to human touch contact and that releases that sort of relaxation response in people, okay? Which to go into controversial type of topics, you know, you have uh, babies who are in cribs where we are not, we are not typically animals, humans and primates. We don't leave our babies laying around. We always have them with us and soothing them and stuff. And then we got to uh, a point where at some point we decided having a baby in a crib crying until they calm down themselves is preferable. Um, or just not having the baby in contact with you often. Like the baby really needs that sort of feeling, that touch and everything. And that goes all the way through life. You need that. Um, people are touch starved. So that talk, that that human to human connection, it releases trauma. It lets you process stuff. Um, being in nature as well, just really good. You know, looking at trees, looking at green, it relaxes your nervous system and you just start processing stuff. Now, most importantly, this is a human issue, right? Like why do humans have these problems, but the cat down the road does not seem to have these issues, right? Or the cats and the dogs, things like that, to nearly this degree unless it's like specifically genetic, you know, in, to that level, they've been bred in such a way, or you can see the genetic component or the mismatch that caused that. But by and large animals form properly. Because what animals do, look at your cat, look at a dog, look at a turtle, look at a bird, they spend most of their time meditating, doing nothing. They just sit there, sitting quietly, doing nothing. Spring comes and the grass grows by itself. Now, this is, you know, I actually tricked you. I said we we're going to go into Wu land and away from peer reviewed science. No, we never go away from peer reviewed science. We're going back into peer reviewed science. So, this is a thread by Manbir Singh. So in the 1970s and 80s, anthropologists working in a small scale, non-industrialized societies noted whatever people were doing in the day, okay? So the most popular activity for humans in non-industrial societies is doing nothing. So they visited random people during the waking hours and they lived in those communities for over a year. And typically there's 60 plus activity codes. So idle doing nothing is the most common. Th this isn't like, you know, nodding, chatting, fixing tools or anything like that. It's sitting there doing nothing, nothing at all. And um, yeah, the median adults spent 27% of, of their waking time doing nothing. It was the most common activity. In Peru, um, again, you, you would spend a lot of time doing foraging, hunting, whatever they do. For the most part, you do nothing. Now, you could say they were thinking. In this modern day and age, you might have a lot to think about. When your world is largely revolving around like what's between that tree over there and that mountain ridge, and that's, I'm being overly simplistic, of course, I don't want to disparage either pre-industrial societies or things but like the world's a lot smaller you don't have this much information flowing into you so when you spend most of your day doing nothing you also just run out of thoughts to think of um so in a funny way like when monasteries and monks and stuff they the recommendation to meditate um there's a funny zen zen way of looking at things which is that there's nothing wrong with you. You, you kind of created the problem yourself. And that's kind of what the Zen monasteries and those sort of uh, schools of thought, because this is typically what humans would do and what animals would do and they develop properly. When you're sitting quietly doing nothing, you, you just relax and you start processing. Things start coming up. So here's a bonus. I'm gonna drop this as an exercise. Okay, I'm gonna drop this into the chat. This is from the course or the previous version of the course. 
is the yoga nidra and yoga nidra is often called the most difficult of yoga poses is it standing on your head is it a handstand what is it no it's just lying there on the floor totally relaxed for as long as you can without moving but not falling asleep remaining alert I want you to try this. And if you have enough awareness right now, you can just be aware of the fact that as you sit here, there's all these thoughts moving through you. There's all this old trauma, all this old junk, some kocha, vrittis. There's a lot of terms for it. And they're contracting your body and they're preventing you from just taking the full proper breath. And the more you feel your body, the more you're going to feel that this is what's going on. Animals don't seem to have these issues. Animals also score lower on IQ tests, but at least they're living healthy. Yeah. So like, what am I teaching you essentially? To do nothing, you, you're messing yourself up. I, and I, I'm a part of that, okay? I don't have the full proper structure. I'm working on this as well. Uh, humans have essentially messed themselves up and it's shown in our structure. This is my proposal there. And when you can feel the structure using the type of things that we're, we're teaching here, then you can really feel how it all ties together. And if you want to start fixing your skull bones, fixing back issues, uh, fixing a, a lot of things, you can use that lo deeper level of awareness to fix them. Okay. So here's a quick poll. I'll ask right now. Have a look at the pictures at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so you got one, two, three, four, and five. Which one of these images is of the human body? Okay, we're getting further into the blue land here. You can pick multiple. I'm going to put the poll up in a sec. You can pick multiple. Okay, so which one of these images is the human body? Inside the human body somewhere. More than one of them might be. Uh, people might not fall from it. You got 33% participation. So please, please drive up that participation level. Give it a guess. You can pick multiple choices. Yeah, some of them you might find more, if you think you can guess what what is what, like picture four is this, picture five is this, you can drop that in the chat, you can take a guess, what do you think each picture is? Good. Give it a shot. Look, you might not be able to see it if you're on mobile, no, that's the issue. Good. So, one and four, people are pretty sure one and four are in the human body. And then the, the other two, so this, this, and this, not quite sure. So if you have a look at this, this right here in the top left, this is human fascia. This is the fascial net inside of your body. Okay, and it sort of runs through everything. It becomes the skin. It becomes the bones. Um, if we don't want to take, um, you know, we're being loose with the definition of fascia, but we're essentially saying there's a web that runs through your whole body. At some points, it manifests as fascia. At some point, it manifests as skin. At some point, it's going to manifest that bone. Um, where your body wants to move a lot, it's going to manifest as muscle. Where your body doesn't want to move much, it's going to manifest as bone. Right? It's just different layers of density. These are different cells. We're not saying it's all the same cells, but this web manifests in different ways um, and it runs through the whole thing. Okay. So we're pretty sure that number one and number four are certainly in the body and the others seem to be a bit more of a toss up. So number four is the lungs. Okay. I'll just move the bar here so you can have a look. Not the whole picture, the bar. Okay, we'll move the whole picture. There you go. So, yeah, so you're right that it's the bone on the left. It might be too blurry. So I might read out. Number three 
is the web of the universe. Now that might be a bit too woo. Okay, I admit it, that was a bit corny. Like I'll admit that was a bit corny. But the idea is that this, this web of fascia is what we're describing it as. This breathing that you're doing has been noticed before that it essentially, it, it goes beyond the human body and it goes deep into the body as well, okay? So when you start tuning into this, which is what religious activities or spiritual traditions all over the world have always said to start tuning into the breath, start feeling yourself as part of the bigger whole. And let's give that a shot, okay? If you can feel your fascia, Every time that you breathe in, you feel your chest expanding slightly. It gets wider, it gets more open. When you clench your fists in anger, get angry, you actually do get angry at someone. Get pissed at something, okay? And contract. You can't expand that much. And then relax. You're more expansive. There's a lot of things in your body especially down the frontal chain that you're holding on to. These things could not, they could be from a time before you remember. Epigenetically, they could be intergenerational trauma. The science is really getting up to that uh, speed there where they're recognizing that certain things are passed down generation to generation. There could be things from previous generations in, in the genetic memory that shows up in your body. So what is you is not just limited to what you think you are. There's parts of you that are older than when you existed. There's parts of you that are before you even formed memory and they're forming the structure of your body. What you think is you is largely limiting your proper growth and development. In the group training we recently had, we discussed things like, uh, do you need to be enlightened then to get proper structure? No, we don't think so. It's, it's just the level of awareness. So when you're really aware of your structure, you can work towards correcting it. Okay? So you're moving towards deeper levels of awareness, which give you more power. You know, When you are a baby, you're not really aware of your hands and feet. You can't use them properly. And then you start putting them in your mouth and touching things and you become aware of them and now you can use them. You have this, the rest of your fascial structure all the way inside of your body. It's there, you're not aware of it. And for almost everyone, it's collapsed and not functioning properly. So you build up that awareness, the breath, the whole body breathes. And then we can work on correction. And with awareness, you kind of spontaneously correct. When you eat an apple, you eat a banana, you drink some water, you don't consciously turn it into the human body, but something within you knows what to do. You built this body, not your ego, not consciously. When you wake up in the morning, something knows how to turn everything on and get this thing working. You can't consciously do it. Your heart is breathing, beating right now. Your liver is functioning. You are operating this body, but you're doing it at a very deep subconscious level. Subconscious is even almost the, not the right word for it. You're doing it at a much deeper level than your superficial level of ego and identity. One thing that you can do, which everyone can do, is you can take the unconscious breathing, which runs through your whole body, and make it conscious. And that becomes your doorway into the subconscious. And if you can get into that subconscious level of understanding, the deeper awareness, well, it knows how to create a body. So, I mean, it should be able to fix it just through awareness by itself. This is something we tell to the people in the practice that as you start feeling the skull bones adjust, you feel asymmetry in one area. You're going to be tempted, like I was for over a year, to try and logically figure it out. What's tight? What's not working? Let me try and pull my body back into shape. 
the fascial webs, the webs of your ego, it's it's like uh, the mind trying to figure itself out. It's like a snaking its own tail. Okay. These, these are deeper. These are very complex webs. And the best thing to do is just have a deep level of awareness and that'll open everything up. Okay. And so like, yeah, we do get into advanced loop by day three. And as you work on these things, everyone who's paid it enough attention starts getting to this point. Okay. Somebody had mentioned to me earlier, like they could feel chakra, certain alignments. So say the chakra of, I don't actually know them that well. I don't pay that much attention to them, but a lot of the time, if you have a trauma down the front of your body and it's like, oh, this trauma is related to this sort of issue. And you look up like a chakra chart, you will find that, yeah, certain types of experiences tend to be stored in certain parts of the body. And that's been recognized by people who have already spent a long time paying attention to this stuff. And they wrote it down and they passed it down through the ages. Okay. Now to put it all together practically and with peer reviewed science, that's what we do here. Okay. That's our project. And our goal is full structural correction. Um, we also do get into that as above. So below you start noticing as your internal patterns change you start relaxing then your your environment outside relaxes to a large degree and those are the sort of you know results that we get back when i started teaching this i did not teach any woo thing i did not bring that sort of stuff up people spontaneously brought it up and it, it is just what it is yeah. um the number one thing we logically say happens is that you have a fascial network running through your whole body. You use it to breathe. The whole thing breathes. And you can start getting cranial adjustments and spinal adjustments if you start paying attention. You can become your own physician in that sort of way. Okay. Now, the final course. So we've done one beta version of the course. Then we did kind of like a, a launch that was for a smaller group of members. And then the final course launch is going to be November 11th. Okay, so the important thing is that you practice. It takes a lot of practice and people get good at it. Don't get your level of fear. Don't get left behind on this because, you know, this, this isn't something where someone can do it for you. This isn't something where someone's going to give you a tool. I'm not selling you a device. Use this and it will improve. So if, if you see the community getting better and better at this the only way to be at the level where the community is at and the level of discussion that we're having is for you to have put in the practice time otherwise you're going to be catching up and catching up and catching up right so please practice because it's about a year ago that we started getting the pops and clicks and opening in the sutures and that sort of movement and things are developing rapidly okay um if you're at all interested let me let me post a poll here and ask if anyone is interested in further training. Because what I'm doing right now is, to be frank, and everyone is seems to be interested in further training. I'll just drop that in here. It seems everyone's interested. I'm dropping an application to come speak with me. Okay, I got to adjust. I'm, I'm telling you, we're doing something very different on this call. This wasn't pre-planned. I know a lot of people get people on webinars. And I mean, there is obviously a business aspect to it. And usually they say, oh, we weren't going to drop the price. And then we drop the price. I'm going against every business instinct because I love this. Okay, like I... This is what I want to do. I love doing it, practicing it on myself, teaching others, and then learning more about it. I've, but there has to be a business to this, okay? If you book a call with me right now, like have a look in the chat. If you're interested, and 100% of people have said yes so far with 50% of people participating right now, go over there, book, even if you already booked a call with me because I've changed my mind since a couple hours ago. 
I'm doing something which makes no business sense, but it feels right to me. Okay, because I've gotten a lot of contacts from people that I, I paid for a lot for business good. I'll just tell you a bit so that you know me, right? This is this will be interpersonal. I paid a lot for business coaching, like a ton. Um, and they told me, like, you know, take people that are not from the US and like Western Europe, like take them out of your groups and stuff because they can't pay for it. And I, I can't do that. And I can't refuse the calls either. And like I understand exchange rates and the way things are, it's it's just an unaffordable thing. I love doing this, and I have to uh, believe that if I continue doing this honestly, somehow I will find the way to fund it and to fund my life because maybe I'll start a family soon. I got people to take care of at this point. Um, I'm getting close to my 30s, so I have people to take care of. Um, so I have to believe that if I just do this, what I'm going to do, book a call with me right now. We'll talk about it. It's not going to make any business sense whatsoever. And if this goes through, this will just be how we go forward with the training as well. Okay. Um, so if you're at all interested, book the call. We'll have a talk. I want you to practice this. I want, um, I'm absolutely hungry to fix these issues for everyone. If someone else comes up with a better system, I will tell you to use their system instead. If, if a new device comes on the market that fixes these issues, I'll just tell you to use that device. I want everyone to get the correction that they desire. That's my deepest desire. Um, and it's been amazing working with everyone in the community and everyone here live. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Okay. We'll go into question and answer. Uh, yeah. So if you are already a training member and you have, you have the one-on-ones. Okay. The people who bought in early. So like if you're new to this, there was a, there was a group of people that was even more core. Um, and so the earlier you get in, the better it is. Okay. Because then I can know you one-on-one -on -one personally. Like I can have a talk with you and we can, we can get you some, well, we're, we'll talk on the call. Okay. Well, we're going to talk on the call. We're going to see what you need and we're going to see how we can make it work for both of us. Okay. There's not going to be any uh, pre-planned pricing. We're just going to figure it out. Okay, so we'll hop over to the question and answer. Um, can I release my fascia using a foam roller? Um, you have fascial adhesions, right? So those adhesions being released is, I know there's a lot of science on the foam roller. I've been looking up this stuff. And again, this is what I say, this is what I do. Like this is my whole job is to full-time research this so that I can give you the community what people say, uh, what works essentially what really is working and that seems to be a controversial topic within the fascia community okay exercise foam rolling things that typically should open up your fascia and open up your body those do work okay um what should we do if we have super tight scms inside of the neck you have the super tightness for a reason at a deep level of awareness you pay attention to what's going on in the sides of your head and you will begin to find you don't have to find the emotional component it might come up automatically but if you just breathe into it say say i totally you take your hand and massage the side of your neck or foam roll it in order to open it up and let it relax that would make sense to you now what if i told you to internally massage yourself because the fascial web runs through your whole body and around your lungs so when you breathe in there's a natural expansion happening all the way up here so you can massage these and open them up using just the breath um someone posted about uh fell i can't pronounce that from feldenkrais that's probably incorrect um yeah i've heard of it i've heard of it and i believe it is the breathing for the scoliosis um in, yes. Is it scoliosis? Well, there's a lot of methodology. There are definitely a lot of methodologies, but um, one thing about ours is that we, we're not gonna have you go to any practitioner, it's you. You are gonna fix yourself. That's the only way that it can happen. Okay. 
um, and I haven't looked into them yet. So when I too pull too hard, it exasperated my TMJ. Please, I, I, I've said this enough times, I think. When I pull too hard, it exasperated my TMJ. Don't pull. Only notice. When you notice through awareness, things start opening up. Yeah. Can working out in the gym a lot tense the fascia? On some level, yeah, but not, not important enough to what we're talking about here. Um, when tensing the hands and feet, do you recommend cycling at the level of breath for prolonged periods of tension? Yeah, so if you are new to this, just notice your breathing. As you get more and more adept with your breathing, you're gonna come up with uh, things like, hey, if I, if I tense the hands and stuff, I can kind of cycle the breath in such a way that I can gently get a lot of movement going. And again, this is, this is perfectly what I'm talking about. You become your own professional. You, you eventually just start learning things about your body that fix itself. And that, that's what I want everyone to get to the level of here. As long as you don't pull hard, don't cause any pain. You, sh you should feel movement. But again, if you have TMJ issues, don't pull. You're just feeling your body. Okay. And yeah, that uh, asked that question. Yeah, that's absolutely excellent. So you can tense your hands and feet and you can kind of cycle the level of breath or like have prolonged periods of tension. Yeah, for sure, go for it. Um, so is awareness simply enough to correct, correct restrictions or do you need to massage and force with your breath? Awareness is enough. Having a little bit of massage into that area can help awareness. It keeps, you, it keeps your attention there. Okay, so like if you can kind of focus on the constriction and focus on the breathing there and massage it very gently, it'll keep your awareness there. And that'll unwind it. Because what doesn't work is feeling into an area that's tight and then breathing hard into it. You can try that, unless it's your TMJ. If it's somewhere in your belly or something, breathe kind of relaxedly hard into it, okay? And you'll, you'll find that that doesn't work. In the same way that if I tell you not to think of something, your brain starts thinking of it. You're, you're, this is all psychosomatic. So the mind runs through the whole body. It's not going to release something until it, it's the proper time to release it. The conditions are correct. You might actually start breathing into one area and another area entirely just pops open because these are webs of fascia. They're layers upon layers, okay? So awareness is what does everything. You don't do anything, really. Um, why do feelings like shame or embarrassment make my face tight and red? instead of my chest, is that normal? Yeah, because it's all connected up into the face. And that is why, uh, as we, somebody had pointed out, uh, multiple people maybe, that as we've established, beauty is essentially health, okay? So the, the way anatomy trains looks at it, the way that uh, traditional Eastern medicine, Chinese medicine, uh, meridian line type things, they, all these lines kind of coalesce at the face, reflexology, things like that. And that is why the face is an immediate indicator of the, the general health of your body, of the tug of your body, of the lines and everything that's going on. Okay, that, that's why you look at the face and that's the primary driver of attraction. We also have some theories circulating like why the butt, why things like that are attractive, the abs. I might as well, the butt being really nice and firm and properly developed is a proper back chain. So if we look at the, uh, the picture here, it goes up through the glutes, right? So this proper back chain goes through the glutes. 80%, I've heard this figure, 80% of the tissue in your glutes is fascial fiber. So if that's firm and properly well-developed, you'll likely have a properly developed back chain, at least up until the hip level. Yeah. Um, is it safe to do... I can't answer your questions about other forms of breathing because they all fit within this, okay? Uh, this is whole body breathing. Uh, your TMJ correction for me was a game changer, shifting the pull to behind the ears instead of front or below. Beautiful, beautiful. And that, see, this is, this is um, people helping each other in the chat. This is the community. So if you, again, I'll drop the link in the chat to speak to me because when you're speaking to me, 
Um, well, there's a public community and then there's a really dedicated group of people that I want people to join. And that's going to be even deeper level of the community. So talk to me. We'll get you into the community. Uh, we'll get you into the trainings. And if you need one-on-one, -on -one, we can discuss that as well. Okay. So thank you everyone for your time here. Um, please keep practicing whether you decide to go forward with the project and the community as a whole or not. This was the last day that we're having today. I really appreciate everyone being here live. These things happen with you. And because of you, we're all going to fix this together. Okay. And I will be around in general if you have questions. Yeah. Thank you.